Hello everyone, this is Sophia Smallstorm and I'm doing one of my podcasts once again. Um, We are going to speak with Janice Barcelo today. I heard of Janice, um, I guess through the grapevine, about six or eight months ago, someone sent me one of her shows. It was on Red Ice, I believe, and I listened to the first hour and I just kept dropping my jaw. I thought, wow, how does she know all this? And everything she was saying had this ring of deep, dark reality to it. And I use that term deep dark reality because we live in a world which is so glossed over with fake stuff, fake um, pretend goodness and niceness and everything will be just fine. And then it doesn't turn out fine. People's health is not turning out fine. Their relationships with their families are not fine and all kinds of things are going Economics is all upside down, as you know, as you know. And it turns out that Janice's specialty, which is um, hospital births, the, the nature of hospital births, that's only one of her specialties. This is what grabbed me when I first listened to her. And I realized that's where it all starts. They have somehow come up with ways to interfere with the natural process of coming into this world such that we are immediately inverted and tipped upside down and um, this the whole path is is stacked against us I'm mixing metaphors but I don't care so without any further delay I want to introduce you to Janice Janice Barcelo welcome thank you Sophia it's good to be here thank you for um, caring about this topic enough to be willing to do a podcast about it because um you know, the way that we begin life really affects the way that we live it. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm feeling that there's probably not any more important information that could, uh, benefit humanity right now than understanding the impact of what we're doing to our children as they enter this dimension. So thank you for being willing to talk about it. Well, Janice, it's my pleasure. I mean, I had suspected some of this, um, before I heard of you and your uh, shows and your website, birthofnewearth.com, I had watched the documentary Pregnant in America, and I was amazed by some of these methods that they use, the administration of uh, Pitocin and the analog, uh, the replacement of oxytocin performed by Pitocin. We'll get into that, but it, that's when it hit me that they are getting in the way of the bonding process between the baby and the mother. So I know you know all about this, but what I want to ask you is, what clued you in? How did you say to yourself one day that you had to get into researching birth? I uh, have a personal background of extreme birth trauma in my life, Uh, in my, you know, in being born uh, in the 1950s to a mother who was completely unconscious, uh, who was given a drug called scopolamine, which is actually called the devil's breath. It it can um, not only create amnesia, which is the intention, but also it gets people to do things. Like if you gave somebody scopolamine and walked up to them and said, go empty out your bank account and give me the money, they would do it. And how Um, do you spell that drug? Um, it's S C O P O L A M I N E. And what class of uh, they they? Oh God, I don't I don't know. They called it twilight sleep in the 1950s. So what it did is it it uh, it basically created amnesia and made the women uh, very very cooperative with anything the medical people chose to do to them. Women were tied down to the beds, sometimes shackled to the beds. They were blindfolded. They were there was horrible, horrible things, and there are horrible images available through various media sources that were documenting this at the time. So when I was born, it was a very dark time. It's it's escalated since then. It's gotten considerably worse actually than it was in the 1950s. But my birth was horrific, and it influenced the way that I gave birth to my own children, which also ended up in extreme trauma. 
I had an infant, for example, my daughter Anastasia, um, who was put in a neonatal intensive care unit for uh, two months and two days. And infants are tortured in the NICU units. They are uh, repeatedly exposed to very, very painful protocols um, several times a day. They are uh, paralyzed while these, while these very mean-spirited things are being done to them, but they're not given any anesthesia. The medical system has insisted for decades that infants don't feel pain. And so uh, they do surgery on infants without anesthesia. They do circumcision on baby boys without anesthesia, cutting off the most sensitive part of an infant's penis, and we'll get into that. Right. But watching... May, may I just uh, ask you a question? Is, yeah. it, is it really that they say that infants don't feel pain, or they say the infants will never remember the pain, or something like that? Because I can't no, they they will they flat they out feel it. They will flat out say that infants don't feel pain. That's beginning to change with more and more people coming forward and saying, you know, I witnessed that circumcision. I witnessed the infant, you know, screaming in ways that I've never heard an infant scream. Uh, so it's clear that the infant is feeling pain. And it's clear to anybody in their right mind that infants feel pain. But we have to remember that medical professionals... Um, Medical school is a form of mind control. It's sort of like military indoctrination where they create extreme sleep deprivation for these students. They make the students do extremely horrific things to animals. You know, I've heard medical students tell stories of basically gang raping cows, you know, shoving their whole fist. Uh, or the whole group of medical students shoving their whole fists into the anus of a cow or the vagina of a, of a cow uh, so that they could feel what it felt like inside the cow's body. I mean, really insane and disgusting forms of torture. Uh, medical students are asked to participate in these things, including circumcision. Medical students are doing pelvic exams on anesthetized women without the, the woman's permission. They're shoving their hands in a woman's vagina while she's under anesthesia. And this is in the context of... And she of has not... Wait a minute. This is in the context of some kind of medical procedure? This is in the context of medical training. This is just medical school. So where do they get... Forget the about it once they're in the system. Where do they get well, the anesthetized women to practice on who don't give permission for this? Every hospital. So they come into a hospital, the hosp and they're being trained, and they go around to different wards, and there are women anesthetized for some kind of procedural something, right. and then they do this. Okay, I, as I understand. Bingo. <laughs> so um, one of the things that's very important to note before we take a trip down this road uh, is that this information is extremely disturbing, and I want to give people a heads up about that and apologize. Uh, you know, for the discomfort that people may feel as the truth is being uh, unraveled and uh, it can make us very uncomfortable. But when we look at the medical system as it is today, how this has been created is really through the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Institute. These are the major uh, players since the 19, early 1900s that have been involved in bribing the medical schools so that they could take over basically medical education, um, implant their pharmaceutical drugs as the main cure, radiation, you know, the slash and burn uh, surgery uh, trip that everybody's on right now in the medical system. What's behind this is Satanism. These people are Satanists. They are incredibly uh, dark intentioned people that have a desire to uh, not only make us sick and keep us sick for a while so that they can take all of our money from us, but to do extreme harm and to make sure that our species is almost it's extinct in the near future. They want what's, you know, only those that have been transhumanized and turned into biological robots. And so they've devised various methods to torture infants while they're still in the womb through prenatal care. I mean, ultrasound is extremely harmful, and we can talk about that. 
Um, so to torture infants while they're in the womb and to torture infants as they're entering this dimension. And they're doing this as a way to alter their brain and to alter their nervous system, to alter the functioning of their humanity and to prevent human love and human bonding from happening at birth because uh, this is a, this is a key to the full development of our brain okay so w when they do an ultrasound at six weeks or whatever the earliest is where you see anything they're actually their intent is not to show the parents a picture of their baby and figure out the sex and all of that um, but it's to to interfere with the development to sabotage the development of the uh, Fetus? Yes. I am I am writing a book about this right now. Uh, <laughs> I jumped into a rabbit hole. I had no idea the extent of the evil behind this technology. But um, ultrasound is being found to create brain damage, to create nervous system problems, to create intrauterine growth retardation, to create miscarriage, to create autism, because there is brain damage happening as a result of the high frequency sounds that are being blasted at the fetus. We know, for example, that when the Navy takes its sonar, which is ultrasound, and blasts it into the ocean, that whales and dolphins will beach themselves with brain hemorrhages. We know that it's, and they've known this from the very beginning, that this technology is lethal to mammals. They've known that they can kill fish instantly, they can cause brain hemorrhages, they can cause skin to, you know, peel off immediately just by blasting. And we don't, we don't hear these frequencies as adults, but because they're being projected off the water in the womb, in the amniotic sac, the frequencies, it's like a, a subway train pulling into a station for the baby that's in the, that's in the womb. So the sonar effect underwater is even worse. Much. Oh wow, that makes a lot of sense. And they know they know this, and they know, of course, that the baby is in water, and they can do maximum amounts of damage. I, I also want to point out that they're using the technology. You can um, expose a scrotum, a male scrotum, to 15 minutes of high-intensity ultrasound frequencies twice. 15 minutes each pop. And that man will become infertile for a minimum of six months and sometimes uh, permanently. So when they say that we're looking for the sex of your baby and all these unconscious mind-controlled mothers are going, oh, yes, tell me the sex of my baby. What they're doing is blasting these frequencies at your baby's genitals. Okay, And part of their intention is to create infertility so that we will stop reproducing and die off. <laughs> if, they're, if they can do this to adult male scrotum, what do we imagine is happening to a baby in the womb whose ovaries are developing or whose testes are developing while they're blasting these frequencies repeatedly? I mean, most, most prenatal care, what, what passes for prenatal care, um, there's at least four ultrasounds. And, and, that, and those are just the, the sonograms, the scans. Every time they listen to the heartbeat with the Doppler machine, that is ultrasound. Every time they attach a mother to a fetal heart monitor at birth, that is ultrasound. And sometimes it's continuous fetal heart monitoring during birth. So imagine listening to a train pulling into a subway station the entire time you're trying to make your way out of the womb. Well, that's the surface um, problem, listening. It's not just the sound, it's the damage, right? I mean, this it's is neurologically brain. damaging. Extremely neurologically damaging, yes. So, so there will be a book coming out about this. It's going to be, I think, simply called The Truth About Ultrasound, and people will know. People will know the, the history and the character of the men behind this technology because they are evil. They are evil. This technology has been evil from its inception. So the people who administer the technology, the, the technician who's running the ultrasound machine and smiling at the mother and trying to make her feel 
calm and special and all that. These people have no idea what they're really um, engaging in, right? Well, um, I would say probably some of them do not. Maybe many of them do not. Some of them do. There's no question in my mind that some of the people working in the medical system absolutely know what they're involved in. And others don't. So it's not, I don't want to say across the board that everybody involved in the medical system is evil because that's totally not true. Um, but everybody involved in the medical system is under a, sub a severe form of mind control that makes them willing to engage in things that their morals, if they were, if they were connected to their own morality, they would otherwise not do. And if there's a woman, you know, there with the ultrasound machine, she's going to be infertile too. If she's been doing ultrasound on babies repeatedly and exposing herself to that technology, she's going to have trouble. The, yeah. the ultrasound technicians are going to have a lot of trouble in their lives. Right. And they are, however, on the more um, minimized end of it because they're not submerged in fluid as the baby is. But they're using it. Yeah, over but and they're, over. they're exposed. Yeah, they're exposed to it constantly. So right. yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of information coming out right now about what's happening to the technicians. This is what happens when you get involved with the dark side, you know. <laughs> and it is it is the dark side. There's no there's no question about this. So and people will will argue with me, but when you see the inf when you see the information that's going to come out in this book. I don't think there'll be any question left about what's going on with ultrasound. And we are just scratching the surface of the technologies that they're using and the damage that they're inflicting on babies. This is before a baby even gets through the birth portal, you know, and actually is in this dimension. So we, there's a lot to talk about just with prenatal care. There's a lot to talk about even... Uh, We've been manipulated around our sexuality, and this is a whole nother topic. So I, I, what I want to stress about this particular topic is that what's happening to babies in the womb matters. How we conceive our babies really matters. Because we are conceiving our children as a side effect of fleshy indulgence, in other words, most people are bringing their bodies together because they want to get off, because they want to have an experience of fleeting physical gratification, and they have zero interest in creating life. But the fact is we are playing with life-creating energy as it's been intended by God. And life comes. It either comes in in a conscious way, where it comes in in a very haphazard way, in a very dark way. And we have many, many millions of people that have been born to parents who do not want them, that have been gestated in wombs where they are not wanted, or where their parents have contemplated abortion or even attempted abortion, okay, or actually had an abortion. One in three babies in New York is being aborted. Um, Janice, there are people, though, you know, who do come together in a soulful way and conceive a baby. But I don't know if the idea of just having sex is what's on everybody's mind who conceives a baby. I mean, I know there are a lot of accidents, accidental conceptions and things like that. Many. Yeah. Many, but many millions. Many, 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 many millions. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, all over the world, all things considered, I would hope that many, many, many babies are conceived with the right intentions and then there's joy experienced upon the knowledge that a baby is going to arrive in nine months or however many months. Well, you know, I feel like you... You know things, Janice, that other people really don't know, and they need to know. And even though it's scary and disturbing, as you say, um, these are things that people have to start considering about their lives. They have to start living 
as many people say, more consciously. And it is a full-time job. It's a full-time job plus, plus, plus to examine everything that you're doing for its dark underbelly, you know? Yep. Um, I do b remember from the Pregnant in America video that a lot of people elected to have children, babies in the hospital because they would feel safer there just in case anything goes wrong, you know. And the fact is that is the trap. That's the place where you're sucked in and they make so many things happen. Some of the, uh, what you mentioned on these shows, I've listened to a number of your shows, the um, ointment that they put in the eye and they obscure the baby's vision immediately so it can't see its mother properly, it can't see its father properly. Do you want to talk about that and then also the um, umbilical I, I, cord? Yes, I would love to talk about those things. It would be helpful to talk about the protocols um, in order so that people uh, can follow the progression. Anybody that's given birth in a hospital will recognize the progression of events that have happened. And I want to speak into what you just said, Sophia, because there has been a tremendous amount of propaganda and um, attempted mind control to convince women and families that hospitals are the safest place to give birth. The, the fact is that the United States has one of the highest rates of maternal and infant mortality in the world. Women and babies are dying in droves in U.S. hospitals and it is precisely because of the, the, the technological interference and the abuse that is being inflicted on mothers and babies during the birth process. Anybody that wants information about the maternal and infant mortality rate in the United States should please visit my blog at birthofanewearth.blogspot.com and simply type in maternal mortality or infant mortality in the search engine and read the articles that I have posted about this extremely important topic. Almost every country on the planet has a better rate than we do. We are extremely, it's extremely dangerous to give birth in the United States. And that is because we are going into hospitals. So to clarify that for people, and I'm telling the absolute truth as opposed to the propaganda that is messing with people's minds. You are in danger if you go to a hospital to give birth. And you are in danger if you yourself were born in a hospital. And that's because... Those of us who were born in hospitals, which is the overwhelming majority of Americans at this time, uh, are carrying massive amounts of birth trauma. And that is likely to activate when we go and give birth to our children. It can repeat itself in the birth of our children. Women give birth the way they were born. Okay, so let me ask you a couple of things. Even if you go like to a hospital, you're living in the depths of Africa, which is considered the third world, or, you know, Bangladesh, or somewhere, um, it's safer to have a baby there than it is in America, in the hospital? Yes. Wow, that's huge. <laughs> it is huge. If you look at the, um, I don't have it right in front of me, but if you give me a minute, I can go and get it. The list of countries that are doing better than we are, it's unbelievable. Hang on just a second. Let me let me pull this up on my own blog. Maternal mortality. Okay, and while okay. you're looking it up, I'm going to plant the second. Okay, so... S okay, go ahead. We have um, countries like Saudi Arabia. Okay, doing better than we are. Basically, every country we see here, Italy, Sweden, Australia, Ireland, Canada, Spain, Japan, Germany, Hungary, Poland, the Netherlands, Albania, the UK, Denmark, France, um, those are the, you know, the EU countries that are doing better. Uh, I can't find the particular article I'm looking for. El Salvador, Afghanistan. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, where they're bombed the, to the bits, you, they're the doing you, better. 
the U.S. was one of only eight countries to see their rates of maternal mortality increase between 1990 and 2013. Afghanistan was bombed, invaded, and occupied by the U.S., you know? Uh, so, yeah, they have seen an increase also. Who, Afghanistan or the U.S.? Yes, and the U.S. The US. Oh, I see. The U.S. Well, has, has, has it... the 60th... All right, we're, we're doing worse than Iran, Kuwait, Palestine, China, Russia, many, many, many countries. Far worse. It's, it's like extremely worse. Well, all right. Let's, uh, my second question was this. When you say that if you were born in a hospital, you had birth trauma because you were probably delivered by, their, by the allopathic methodology. But then it's rekindled when you give birth. But... Is, is it dangerous to you at other times in your life? This trauma, obviously, trauma is trauma, and trauma makes a mark on the body. It makes a mark on the emotional body and the physical body. So is it possibly re, uh, rekindled or uh, evoked all through your life? Yes, it affects it affects our psychology. It affects our physical health. It affects our ability to love. If you have not had an opportunity to bond with your mother at birth, that will negatively affect the bond with your mother throughout life. Okay, unless somehow there's a healing of the birth trauma early on. But and if you have never bonded with your mother or your father, that means that your ability to bond in general is going to be severely undermined. If you have never had the opportunity at birth to produce oxytocin through the element of human love because it's being severely interfered with, I mean severely interfered with, then your, your body's ability to produce oxytocin, oxytocin is the hormone of human love, it's the hormone of human bonding, your body's ability to produce it throughout life will be affected because you are brain damaged from not having uh, the neurobiology of love uh, activate at birth. This okay, is, it's, I'm getting chills, it's amazing. And I, it, I, when I get chills, I believe what's happening, what's going around, on around me, what I'm being told is true. Well, this is huge, and this is what's wrong with, with, with what's happening to our species right now. It's why so many of us are having a difficult time accessing human love, connecting with authentic, enduring experiences of human love and relationship. And it's because we've been robbed. You know, our birth has been hijacked. It was hijacked in many cases from the moment of conception because we were conceived in a, you know, in really despicable ways, basically, with people that don't love each other, who are having sex for reasons that are not of love. All right, so it's, it's not just at birth. It's in the womb. When a, when a baby is gestating in a womb where it's not wanted or its mother is thinking about murdering it... Yes, this is going to influence our psyche. It's going to influence whether we, we ever feel like we can be loved, whether we feel like we are lovable, inherently lovable. Okay, we can feel like we are inherently unlovable because our first relationship was one of not love. Right, I understand that. Or love's opposite. So... I know that oxytocin is part of the, uh, or interfering with oxytocin, giving pitocin, um, and even these other things that I was uh, touching on. Can you start with the order of what they do in hospital birth so that you yes. can understand? Yes. Sure. So normally what's going to happen is people are going to be going for prenatal care. They're going to be getting their ultrasounds. At some time in their ultrasound, they're going to be told during one of these things. Many of them are going to be told, oh, your baby's too big for your pelvis, we're going to have to induce your baby, or your fluids are too low, we're going to have to induce your baby, or, you know, uh, you're, you've passed your due date according to their <laughs> schedule, we're going to have to induce your baby. One in three children being born right now is going to be forced out of the womb before it is ready. And I want to say in a natural situation, 
babies are in charge of deciding when it's time to be born. When they are fully developed, they will signal their mother's body that they're ready to come out of the womb and the mother will begin producing the neurochemicals of birth and the birth process will ensue. When that dominion is stolen from a baby through induction, and remember one in three children now suffers this this predicament, it's going to cause an imprint in the baby that says there's something outside of me controlling my destiny, I have no power over my life, something else is running it, and that something is not loving. That something does not have my best interests at heart. It's going to force me to be born prematurely. I'm going to be born underdeveloped. And I'm going to be born in the most horrendously brutal way known ever on this planet, as far as I'm aware of. Um, so let me, let me say the thought real quick before you go on, Sophia. And that is to say, we can mistake that energy for God. That it is God who's out to get us, that it is God who's controlling our life in a negative way. And it is not God, it is the opposite of God. Wow. Now, when a baby is induced, um, it's obviously for more than reasons of convenience. They give you these fake medical um, reasons and so forth. But when you said the baby's going to be born prematurely, it may be born prematurely, but only by a couple of days, right? Or is it, is, is even, I understand that that's already a, a huge, uh, huge uh, ding in the karmic and actual uh, way of things. But it, they're not delivering babies weeks before they're supposed to be born, right? Oh, yes, they are. Uh, you know, I, I heard a story very recently of a woman who was given chemotherapy drugs throughout her pregnancy and told that that was perfectly safe. And then she was told that uh, she had to deliver at 37 weeks. We know that the lungs aren't fully formed yet. We know that the, the development of the brain is going to be negatively influenced and the baby's breathing and the baby's immune system. Uh, not to mention the baby's been poisoned the entire time it's been in the womb through the chemotherapy drugs. But yes, they were going to induce her at 30 seven weeks and then they were going to take her placenta and cut it in half and give it to two different medical institutions <clears throat> so they could study whether or not there was cancer on the placenta and this is a huge spiritual uh, battle that's happening and we'll talk about it more when we get to the placenta but yes from between 37 and 39 weeks <clears throat> they can very often do induction during that time. The fact is, babies can spend 44 weeks in the womb. Depends on the baby. Okay, so even if they wait until the baby's at 41 weeks and two days, according to their time clock, okay, that baby could still have three weeks of gestation, two and a half weeks of gestation that it needs to become fully developed. We are messing with a, you know, a very important natural event that has an intelligence that humans do not comprehend or care about. Right. Except, for the, except for the evil people behind this. And, and they know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. They know how to mess with us on a grand scale. So uh, let me finish talking about what's going to happen if you allow them to induce you as a mother, okay, mm -hmm. most women during induction are going to be given a drug called Cytotec or miso Misoprotol. I don't know how to pronounce it. Cytotec is actually an ulcer drug that's being off-label, being used off-label or actually against label because on the label it says do not use on pregnant women <laughs> because it can cause miscarriage. Okay, It's being used to uh, do what's called ripening the cervix. Um, what it does also is cause extremely intense uterine contractions that are leading to uterine rupture and death. 
okay, and uh, also what's called amniotic fluid embolism, where the amniotic fluid will leak into the mother's bloodstream, make its way to her heart, and immediately kill her. And if you have a situation where a baby has been born, the mother and baby have made it through the birth process alive, they've had a few minutes to bond according to, you know, birth procedures in, in hospital, and then the mother suddenly dies, the first question you want to ask is, was this drug given during the birth process at any time? Because this drug is responsible for killing women and babies on a massive scale. And uh, there's websites cropping up all over the Internet to support the victims of Cytotec during birth. The other drug that they're going to be using to force the baby out of the womb before it is ready and I'm going to speak it as it is, I'm speaking the absolute truth about this, is a drug called Pitocin in the United States or Synctocin or something different it's called. What it is is artificial oxytocin. It's synthetic oxytocin. When a mother is given a chemical drug of artificial oxytocin during birth, it will trick her body to such an extent that her body will not be producing very much of the real thing. And oxytocin, in its God-given form, is absolutely necessary for that mother and baby to bond properly, for the, for the proper development of the infant brain. It's necessary for uh, healthy contractions during birth. It's necessary for the letdown of breast milk uh, or, or the colostrum immediately after birth. And if it's not pouring through the mother's body at birth, it will influence not only her capacity to love and bond with her baby, but her capacity to feed her baby after birth. So Pitocin is a dangerous and ugly drug for that reason alone because it will undermine bonding. But the other thing that it does is that it, it does a lot of stuff, but it causes uh, extremely intense uterine contractions. So in a natural birth, a contraction will come, it will peak for like 20 seconds and then it will ease off okay so it'll build it'll peak it'll ease off it'll take about a minute you know 90 seconds uh, by the time the contraction is done and the body will rest before the next contraction but with pitocin what happens is the contractions just come one on top of another on top of another like they're just it's a I, I always say it's like turning the uterus into a trash compactor so the baby's being crushed and squished and smashed, and the mother is extreme in extreme pain to the point where she's going to go insane if she doesn't get some form of pain relief. And we start the cascade of interventions uh, that, that are so helpful in terms of destroying human love and destroying brain function for the, for the infant. <laughs> uh, so Pitocin is an extremely ugly drug. We know that the medical people are... Uh, giving an order called pit to distress, which means that they know that Pitocin causes fetal distress, okay? They know it, and they're using it deliberately to cause fetal distress. They're giving nurses orders to give so much Pitocin that they will deliberately cause fetal distress so that they can move more quickly to a C-section. And nurses are blogging about it. And so we have a lot of evidence about what these doctors are doing so that they can get to their golf game or do whatever it is that they want to be doing instead of attending the birth of this baby and uh, the mother that's giving birth to this baby. So, so I just want to ask, is there profit to be made by C-sections? Not only is it uh, more time efficient, I, use, I say that, you know, with sarcasm, but... Uh, they don't want to wait 11 hours of labor for their patient to deliver. They'd rather just make excuses and tell the nurses to pit to distress so that they have to deliver more efficiently. They get to deliver more efficiently. Is that what this is about? Well, it's so that they get to control the birth. 
there's nothing efficient about a cesarean section. It, no, I mean, it, I it's quicker. It's quicker for the doctor for sure, um, and they can move move them through the <laughs> you know the conveyor belt and get other people into those rooms. Uh, but there's nothing efficient for the mother or baby about a cesarean section. And yes, they, they cost considerably more. Cesarean births can be $40,000, right. you know, where a regular birth might be six, seven, eight, nine, depending on the amount of drugs that they're doing and uh, that they're using. There's nothing natural or normal about a hospital birth at all. It's a totally alien environment to our species. It's only been happening for about 100 years, and it is damaging us on a grand scale. Uh, and I know you have another question, but there is something else I want to say about um, induction, so don't let me forget to do that after you ask your question. Okay. Um, my question was this, going back a little ways in our interview. You had said that a baby can spend up to 44 weeks in the womb. And yes. I did some math while you were talking, and we call a month four weeks, but it's actually four weeks in a few days. But anyway, any if you look at that, that's that's a long time. I mean, that's ten months plus. I did the math on the days. So, it, what? Where does this nine month thing come from? It comes from a, fic, a fictitious, uh, made up time schedule. That's, wow. conven that's convenient for the medical system. Babies are not, very, very, very few babies are born on their due date. And that's because it has no value. Seriously, have, it has no value. But ha doesn't it, um, pre the whole idea of nine months predates allopathic medicine. I mean, haven't people been saying for hundreds of years, maybe thousands, that pregnancy is nine months? Uh, you know, I wouldn't know because I'm not living thousands of years ago. I'm living now, and I don't believe anything that they say about history. Nothing. Right. I agree. Nothing. But that's very interesting because um, you, I swear I've read books that were, you know, written a long time ago, let's just say. I know allopathic medicine dates to something like the uh, early 1900s, late 1800s, but I would think, I would have believed that all of humanity thought and knew and calculated that um, babies are born nine months after they're conceived. And you find out that they're conceived because you miss a period or something. But I think there's much most more people, to that. Most people have no idea when they conceived. Yeah. Um, they, they may have a sense from their cycle, but because con conception is not conscious most of the time, they don't know when they were having sex, which time they conceived, on what day they conceived. They don't know. Right. We sh we should know, because well, that that's, that's that would we require consciousness around it. But <laughs> there's tremendous unconsciousness around this. I know that women that I've known who have found out they were pregnant and then went to the doctor for their first prenatal checkup or whatever, they come back with a due date and they're always saying it's crazy. How do they think my baby is going to be born at that time? It doesn't make any sense. So that I have seen myself, the disbelief or the skepticism that women hold for the due date they're given. And then I can see why and how the system would move them toward that due date because they schedule the birth just like they schedule anything and everything else. That's right. And they get to do all kinds of things to the women who accept, oh my God, my baby's late. Uh, oh, my, my baby's late. I better do something to get my baby out of there right away because what do they think? The baby's not going to come out? No, they probably think it's going to die in there. Yeah, that's what they're told. They're told that in a million different ways, you know? So uh -huh. the whole system is based on terrifying mothers and, and uh, pushing them into acquiescing to these horrific, horrific technologies. So let me say one more thing about induction, and that is because they're using Cytotec and because they're using Pitocin, they know that the baby is likely to go into fetal distress, and so they're going to do something called fetal heart monitoring. Sometimes they're going to do continuous fetal heart monitoring through the birth process. As I mentioned before, fetal heart monitoring involves the continuous use of ultrasound if it is continuous. In some cases, they're going to do what's called an inter internal fetal heart monitor. What this means is that they are going to take their 
hands and their arms and stick their hands and their arms inside the vagina of a laboring woman, there's going to be a probe in their hand that they're going to screw into the skull what? of the baby who is trying to make its way through uh, the birth portal. I, I don't want to call it a birth canal because when we say the words canal, when we use the maritime language of law, we're immediately putting ourselves into the context of a slave system. So the birth portal is not a canal. It's a portal. It's mm -hmm. a portal in between dimensions. And I'll say it over and over again. I'm going to avoid using the word canal. If it slips out, it's an accident. Um, so, yes, they're going to screw this thing into the baby's skull. For anybody that's interested to see a picture of this, I have pictures of it <laughs> on my blog at birthofanewearth.blogspot.com or you can email me at janiceparcello at yahoo.com. I would be happy to send you a picture of this, this thing that's screwed into the baby's skull. So now we have an infant. Uh, 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 trying, being forced out of the womb, okay, with contractions that are squishing it to death, okay, intense contractions that are causing fetal distress, and we have something screwed into its skull so that every time there's a contraction, that probe is going to pull and tug at the baby's skull. From a spiritual perspective, we know that that soft spot in the baby's head is a place where the baby would otherwise be receiving a download of information from the divine mind as it makes its transition from the womb into the physical world. All right, but they are interfering with that. I mean, what kind of psychopath would think to screw something into the skull of a baby unless they wanted to hurt the baby. What type of psychopath would use a drug that they know is going to cause fetal distress, that they know is going to traumatize the baby and the mother unless they wanted to hurt the baby? I want people to get what's behind this. There's something called trauma-based mind control. If you can expose people to enough trauma, you can alter the functioning of their mind permanently Okay, unless they seek help. But most people are not aware that they've been exposed to trauma-based mind control and they have been exposed to it from the minute that they entered this dimension before they got out of the womb. All right, so that's just induction. There's right. much more. There's much more to talk about. Let me know when you're ready. <laughs> no, I'm ready. I'm just processing some of this. So I want to get back to screwing this thing into the baby's skull. They have to somehow put this probe in the baby's body, right? And they chose the skull. I mean, no place is good, but it just seems to me like this is... Is there no other way they can monitor fetal heartbeat without sticking something, you know, vicious into this baby? Of course there's ways that they could monitor the heartbeat. They've done it for, you know, many hundreds of years. You know, there's this device that midwives used to use where they'd put one part of it, it looked like a horn. Yeah. Right? They put one part of it up to their ear and the other part of it on the mother's belly and the baby's heartbeat would echo into this device. Very simple, non-invasive, didn't involve ultrasound, certainly didn't involve screwing anything into the baby's skull. The reason they're screwing it into the skull is because the baby is going to normally be head down. Right. Right. Okay, That's so they can go... That's amazing to me. And, and, you know, it's the old way, the horn way is obviously too low-tech for them and too kind. Uh, That's right. And I imagine as medical students uh, stand by and watch this in their training, they don't even f want to ask to question it because, number one, they're mentally conditioned already to witness and participate and train in these horrible procedures. But number two, um, this is considered advanced, glorious medicine, right? Correct. They're mind controlled. And they may be afraid, even if they have a, a prick of conscience or a question. They may be afraid to ask that. That's right. 
It's incredible. That's right, because they'll be shunned, you know, or they'll be uh, ostracized completely. They won't be allowed to participate. They won't graduate from medical school. Yeah, I mean, medical students are going through a lot. They're going through a lot. I think many of them start out really wanting to help, but then they become, they become numb. Well, they become so overwhelmed. I knew a lot of young doctors because I had friends who worked in a big medical, you know how they started to call all the hospitals medical center. So I knew lots of people from techs in the ER to x-ray techs outside the ER and just and the doctors themselves and every everybody in hospital they they are a clique they do everything together they all are friends and they go places together and drink together and they marry it's a each cult. other yeah this it's is a why cult. doctors and nurses so many of them marry each other um, because I think they're all part of this system and they form bonds within it themselves and deep down to know how um, how destructive they're really being but they they're too deep, too invested to do anything, and too guilty to do anything about it. I want to stress it is a cult. It is a cult that's based on mind control. Um, and yes, you're right, they're deep in it, and they don't see a way out, especially if they've got their house and their cars and their, their way of life that depends on the money, you know, that's made by being part of this very dark system. But it's basically, you've sold your soul if you're part of it. You know, and it's, at some point, it's going to have to come due because what you're doing to people, if I, I, I can't even begin to say, I'm just talking right now about the maternity wards, okay? Yeah. I can't even begin to tell you the rest of the stuff that's going on in the medical system. We might, if we have a chance to touch on that, we should do it. But it's, it's, it's just unbelievably bad, Sophia, unbelievably evil. I'm going to say something real quick, okay? If you end up in a hospital in a coma, and God forbid you're a teenager, you're in your early 20s, you're at a time in your life where they want your organs, all right, they're gonna cre they've created a ficto fictitious diagnosis called brain death, so they can, they can basically murder you and grab your organs. But when you have your organs taken out, most people become organ donors because they think that they're giving their organs after they die. The truth is, people are very much alive when the medical system is harvesting their organs. They are paralyzed while their chests are being cleaved open, literally. Okay, one by one their organs are removed. The last organ to be removed is the heart, because once the heart comes out, the person will really be dead. All right, but they're paralyzed, given no anesthetic because they're, they've made up a lie that they're brain dead and not feeling anything. The same thing that they're saying about babies not feeling anything. I'm telling you that these people are being cleaved open, literally butchered to death by the medical system, and their organs are being sold. And this yeah. is a, a multi-million dollar, billion dollar business. I've heard you talk about this before on other shows, but now I get to ask you my questions about it. So when you write down that you're an organ donor, I think most people think that they'll be dead, like you said, and that one organ will be taken. Um, but so my questions are, number one, is an organ any good after you're dead? No. Okay, so it has to, that makes sense. Then it has to be taken right before you're dead, but someone has to decide you're about to die, and that person obviously isn't you. Right. Correct. Correct. And I had no idea that people's people were basically hollowed out like this, and they were everything was taken: kidneys and spleen and pancreas and everything. Right. Yep. Wow. That is, and so yeah. they do this. Yeah. I mean, if they're if they're healthy, so you they, know, they do want this particularly to youth because they well, have the healthiest organs, like the uh, quote unquote brain dead teenager that comes in after an auto accident. Yes, that's the organs they want the most. Wow. Yeah. Well, they're also, I mean, let's not go there yet. They, there's a whole new business right now that's coming up all over the Internet about uh, giving infant blood, children's blood, to older people to help regenerate the older people. So now they've been going after the young people. And especially children. 
They want their blood. They want their body parts. This is why we got to be careful with the placenta, and we got to be very attentive to the fact that they're stealing the infant cord blood, knowing absolutely knowing that it's hurting the baby to steal the baby's cord blood. But that's the, let me let me talk about the rest of the birth protocols before we get to the uh, clamping and cutting of the umbilical cord and the theft of the cord blood and the placenta, because there's other things um, to talk about first. So I'll, I'll just want to pick up uh, at the point of uh, now we, we did the induction part. Okay, we talked about Pitocin. Um, what I want to say also, one other thing about Pitocin is because of the intensity of contractions, it's going to make the mother beg for the epidural. An epidural is a form of anesthesia that they put, I mean, it's a, a liquid that they put directly into the cerebral spinal fluid. <laughs> Through the spine, they inject this fluid, and the fluid will uh, ideally numb out the bottom half of the mother's body so that she can't feel anything uh, during the birth process. Um, epidur with epidural, the mother is going to be forced to, to lie down because she can't stand or anything. She can't feel the bottom half of her body. So uh, in, just in the act of lying down, her pelvis is going to narrow. The blood vessels that are supplying the oxygen to her baby are going to narrow. Her baby's oxygen supply is going to be minimized by the very act of her lying down. Um, she's going to be so incapacitated that... Other people will have to roll her over if she wants. She can't even roll over onto her side by herself without other people helping her. So she certainly can't be getting into positions. You know, in a natural birth, mothers will stand up. They'll squat. They'll spiral their hips, you know, to help move the baby through. They might lift a leg up on the bed to open up their pelvis. Uh, there's all kinds of different th movements that the mother will do to help her body get, help her baby get born, because she feels her body and because she feels her baby trying to make her way through, which the epidural mom is not going to be doing. So if mom can't feel anything that, and mom can't stand up, mom can't help her baby get born, which means her baby is on its own, literally, trying to get born against gravity, all right, with extremely intense Pitocin contractions, with a screw, you know, stuck in its skull, and now it's been abandoned. Okay, trying to make its way through all of this freaking nightmare all by itself. On and top it knows of the, that, right? Of course it experiences this. It's feeling all of this. Where is my mother? Why isn't my mother helping me? Why isn't is she even making contact with me? Mm. All right, and on top of this... The epidural is another drug that tricks the brain, okay? The brain says, oh, in a natural birth, the brain gets that there's a birth going on, <laughs> okay? And will be sending all kinds of signals to produce endorphins, beta endorphins, and uh, <sighs> dopamine, all kinds of happy hormones and happy drugs, uh, natural opiates of birth, to make the birth pleasurable and to make the birth endurable for the mother and the baby. That's in a natural birth. Okay? So now the epidural's here and the brain's going, oh, there's nothing happening. I guess I don't need to send the signals for these happy hormones to go into the body. So there's going to be none. Okay? There's going to be no opiates of birth. There's going to be nothing Whoa. to help the mother deal with the birth. But you know what? It's not just about the mother even though everybody seems to think it is. The baby needs these opiates in order to have the birth, in order to make the birth process endurable and good for the baby. Right, and in order to know that a good thing is happening by being born and coming into the world. Yeah, but these hormones, I mean, these, this cocktail of hormones is so critical for the mother-baby bonding and for the birth experience to be a good one. You know, the birth experience needs to be a good one for the bonding to happen. It needs, mothers and babies need to feel love at the birth. They need to feel joy when the baby comes out. The, not terror, 
you know, not confusion and delusion because all these drugs have separated the mother from her body and uh, created trauma for her and their babe for her and the baby. No, Janice, can I ask you a question? I know that some people go to the hospital and they do natural birth in the hospital. They do the Lamaz classes and does that is that any better? What are you talking about when you say natural birth, Sophia? What does that look like in a hospital? Well, that's the point. I'm just saying that I I have not given birth, so I don't know. But I have friends who say, oh, no, my wife is doing Lamaze, or I'm doing Lamaze. And they go and they have they give birth in a hospital, but they say they've given birth the more natural way. So there's some kind of confusion around this. In everybody's mind, that's not natural. Just being in a hospital is not natural to start with. That's correct. Right. And so, I think they call natural birth if the baby actually comes out of the vagina. They could call it a natural birth if the mother was given an epidural and pitocin, if, as long as the baby comes out of the vagina. You see, this is the twisting that's been going on. There's nothing natural about using any drug whatsoever during birth that is yeah. not natural. That is unnatural. That is interfering with the natural hormones of birth. And it will interfere and undermine with love every time. There's no way around this. Every one of these drugs, Demerol, you know, if they're given anesthesia because let's say, okay, you know, now we've got the induction going on, we've got the epidural happening, of course the baby can't get out, right? Uh, so they're going to now have to do a C-section. Yay! Let's do the C-section. One in three women is, uh, is being C-sectioned. One in three babies is being literally cut out of the mother's body. That's a minimum because in New York, it's one in two in many of the hospitals. In places like Brazil, 90% of these births are happening by C-section. Wow. So it's a huge number of babies that are being forced out of the womb sur through surgery. Mothers are undergoing surgery. And I just watched a video the other day where I was in so much pain watching a two at most a two-minute video, they had pulled this baby out through C-section. The mother is completely wasted, literally. The baby is put next to the mother by her face so that she can, the baby can see the mother and the mother can see the baby. And the baby is grasping, right, trying to grab the mother's nose or anything. And the mother is completely not responsive. No response whatsoever. She couldn't look at the baby. She couldn't bring her hands up to touch her baby. I don't know if she was even conscious. And you could see the baby desperately trying to make contact with its mother. And the nurse or whoever was holding this baby, I couldn't tell, was kind enough to leave the baby there for like a minute. Right? And you could see the baby beginning to regulate itself instead of going into hysterical fear and terror. Right? Just... The baby recognizes this is mother because of the smell of the mother's body, right? The baby's next to the mother's face and can smell the mother's face mm -hmm. and was beginning to self-regulate, at which point they take the baby away from the mother completely. So the ba not only does the baby now have an imprint where, oh my God, is my mother dead? What, why isn't she responding to me? Will she ever respond to me? Nobody's ever going to respond to me. You know, I'm all alone. These people are going to do bad things to me. They, the babies can feel it. They know that they're dealing with evil. We know as infants that we are dealing with evil. We can feel the energy of what's happening in hospitals. Okay, so this baby is going to be dealing with overwhelming amounts of terror and trauma not the least of which is that it, the mother could not respond to her baby at all. And this is, this is the impact of some C-sections. In other C-sections, the mother is conscious. Okay, it depends on how they're doing it. I mean, ideally, it would be great if they were doing it and every woman was conscious and every woman could hold her baby immediately after birth and they'd be left alone for the next hour. What you don't want to do, especially during the first hour after birth, is to separate them, even for one second. That cocktail, that neurochemical cocktail, 
for the first hour after birth will never, ever, ever happen again, ever, in that mother-baby lifetime. And when you mess with that by separating them or putting other drugs into the mother's body, you are very badly interfering with the bond between mother and, and child. And of course, if the mother can't bond with her baby, which is too much of the time during cesarean section, her body is going to say, what's the matter here? We just had a birth. There's no bond happening. The baby must have died. Yeah. This is really what the body thinks. So now the mother has postpartum depression. And now we have everybody in the world experiencing postpartum depression, which is completely, it's a response to, it's like the body's grief of the baby being dead, because that's what the body thinks. The body has no evolutionary way to understand the lack of bonding after birth. Well, so this really explains uh, what the whole postpartum blues yep. come from, which we hear referred to frequently. Husbands will say, oh, my wife. Had, but they never know that this is it. This is why. It's because of birth trauma. And it's because of the interference with bonding. That's right. what's causing postpartum depression. This is not part of the divine plan. None of this is part of the divine plan. This is all running counter. And that's their goal. You know, if you understand, this is one of the hardest things for people to accept and to hear. If you understand that we're dealing with satanic ritual abuse, that this is satanic ritual abuse, that there are Satanists and Luciferians behind this abuse, what we know about these people is that they enjoy destroying what God creates all right there's a there's a competition going on between Lucifer and God okay God God is a loving being God created life in a way that we would experience love and joy and then Lucifer comes along as an angel and decides he wants to be as powerful as God he doesn't want to be underneath God he's going to prove himself as powerful by undermining everything that God creates and we've got people worshiping this entity and working for this entity to undermine everything that God creates. And hence we have Luciferians and Satanists destroying everything in the natural world, spraying chemtrails on us, putting mercury in our dental fillings, putting fluoride in our drinking water, growing genetically altered food and humans, all right, uh, creating chimeras, vaccinating us to destroy our immune system and mess with our DNA, um, I could, you know, poisoning us through pharmaceutical drugs. There's so many angles that they're coming at us and the natural world. Everything that's beautiful and good is being deliberately undermined. So, of course, they're going to come after birth. Of course, they're going to come after the bond between mothers and babies and fathers and babies. They're good. They're, they take great delight. You know, they're back there rubbing their hands together going, hey, man, how else can we destroy this? Talk about the fathers in the umbilical cord, please. Oh, this is a big one. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, if you're if you're lucky enough to come out of a birth can a, a, a birth portal, I caught myself there. If you're lucky enough to come out of the vagina, and if you're not, what's happening in hospitals is they're going to immediately clamp and cut the umbilical cord. In some cases, they might wait a minute or two or three, you know, and, that, and then they call that delayed cord clamping. I want to stress, before I talk about the father's piece in this, is that when a baby is born, a baby is not breathing. And that's okay, because the baby is receiving all of the oxygen that it needs through the blood that's pumping through that umbilical cord into the baby's body. The baby was not breathing in the womb. Right, it was receiving all the oxygen through the same blood that's pumping through the placenta and the umbilical cord into the baby's body. So a baby can be born underwater, and that baby can be underwater for five minutes without breathing. It's perfectly fine. All of its oxygen needs are being met through that blood supply. When you clamp and cut that umbilical cord immediately after birth, what you are doing is cutting off the baby's oxygen supply and forcing the baby to gasp in desperation for its life. This is another um, terrifying 
thing that they're doing. It's very mean-spirited. Let me also say that that blood contains stem cells that are absolutely necessary for the proper development of the baby's immune system. That blood is also necessary for the proper activation of the lungs and of the nervous system. That blood is one-third of the baby's blood supply. So when you clamp and cut the umbilical cord, you are forcing the baby to be born in a hemorrhage state, which will cause a cascade of problems to ensue that could end the baby up in a neonatal intensive care unit where they can further torture the baby. That blood is incredibly important for that baby to receive at birth. So here we have the manipulation happening behind the scenes where they're encouraging parents to do the cord blood banking. Okay, let's, let's deprive your baby of its blood at birth, supposedly so that we can save the stem cells and give it to your baby later on when your baby's going to get sick because we deprived it of its stem cells at birth. It will have a much more weakened immune system than a baby that has received all of its blood. And we know that the baby receives all of its blood when the umbilical cord is white. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have the umbilical cord pulsing blue, purple, if you see any blood in that umbilical cord, then that, leave it alone. Leave it alone until it turns white. And is that this means- what people in other cultures who we would call primitive people, they know this? They absolutely know this. They know a lot more than this, too. Let me also say one thing, is that they're getting fathers to initiate the baby into the satanic cult by getting fathers to cut the cord prematurely. I just heard a radio show the other day where they were interviewing, I think it was a three-year-old, talking about what its father had done by cutting the umbilical cord. Wait a minute. You mean in a proud way or the three year old? No, the baby said it was extremely scary and painful. And he the, could the children this? the children are remembering. Yeah, the children can remember. If you have if they have parents that support them in talking about it as soon as they can talk, babies will tell you exactly what happened. Wow. Yeah. They remember birth we all remember birth. It's all in our ourselves. It's, we're never going to forget. Our conscious mind may forget because the intensity of the trauma is so great that we repress it. Mm-hmm. All right, but the, the body remembers everything and we can access those memories at any time when we are resourced enough to do so. So children with parents that are conscious will talk to you about it. They'll tell you what happened. They'll tell you how they felt about it. Well, but if those parents, I mean, if they're conscious enough to help their children evoke these latent memories, then hopefully they were conscious enough not to put their children through this. Yeah, well, some of them weren't. Yeah. Obviously. But Janice, I want to, again, for the listeners, make it clear that the fathers are being brought into this whole, um, as you call it, satanic... Um, cult. cult. It's a cult. Yes. But they are being asked to be, you know, you cut the umbilical cord here. You can be the proud father. And the baby knows that its father is doing this to it. And that's yes. another um, another huge traumatic blow, right? To the Big psyche. time. Big time. And you have to understand that uh, the baby also will uh, distrust its parents immensely if all of these things have happened because they will get instantly they may already distrust their parents because of what's happened in the womb and what's happened during conception they may not trust anything that their parents say or do because there's been no integrity from the beginning but if the parents have allowed this kind of stuff to happen at birth of course the children will distrust their parents especially if it's a baby boy and the parents have allowed circumcision which we haven't gotten to yet. Right. But this is major big time stuff. And babies know, babies are incredibly conscious and aware and more, much more than we have been led on to believe. They know everything that's going on and they know that there's evil there and they know that their parents are being fooled by it. 
So how can they respect or trust their parents? How can they uh, properly bond with their parents if they, if they get immediately that the parents won't protect them from this evil? It's a massive problem. It's you know, a massive problem. There are so many times, again, I'm not a baby person, I haven't had babies, and I haven't been the kind of person who loves to pick up any baby and hug it and carry it around, because I don't, I don't, I don't know, I, either I don't trust myself or something, but there are some women who aren't all over babies, but I'll tell you this, there are so many times that I have walked by a parent who has a little stroller with a tiny baby in it, sometimes it's a toddler or, you know, like two, two, one, two years old, sometimes it's even younger than that. And they turn and they look at you, and it's like they're trying to signal you in some way, and they won't stop looking at you. And I feel, and this may be crazy, that this baby is trying to tell me something, and is trying to say, I know you, I know you don't think like the rest of them, you know what I'm saying? So yep. it just feels like there are babies out there who are reaching out to signal people or to try to find a like mind and even though I'm not a baby person I feel uh, compelled to look at these babies and there's nothing I can do short of racing after their parents and saying why is your kid staring at me like that you know <laughs> well it's true they are reaching out for somebody of common resonance who can see them who can get them who can help them heal their trauma and they sense who those people you know the people that are aware of it right away yeah. So, yeah, babies are very, not only extremely sensitive and vulnerable, but extremely wise and deeply feeling and knowing they well, are. That's more uh, how yeah. I regard babies. I feel like they're not just these toys to be picked up immediately and exactly. cuddled and cooed over. They're like little hallowed beings. And when you're in the presence of a baby, you're in the presence of something really fantastic. And you should just be there in its presence without, you know, rushing at it and trying to engulf it in your, whatever it is, your enthusiasm for, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I just see people just, they swarm over babies and I, I don't know why they're doing that. Why are they doing that? Because they're, they're grabbing the baby's energy. See, the baby's coming in with a, you know, the full-on God energy that we've all been uh, distanced from. And birth attendants are, are many of them, vampires. They are sucking the life force of the babies, uh, and <laughs> seriously. And so if, you, uh, if you're a mother or a father and your baby's just been born, you don't want anybody else's hands on your baby. I mean, that's just insane to let anybody else touch your baby. In my opinion, we need to protect our baby's field. We need to protect our baby's energy. And we need to protect the God energy and the God being that they are without other people slobbering all over them and stealing from them and vampiring from them. And that's all what's going on. Wow. It's a, hu a huge vampiring, even by the parents. You know, the ingestion of the placenta. Let me... Str let me, this is another big thing, is that the Satanism is becoming infested into the mainstream. So we're being encouraged to take an organ that belongs to our baby. The placenta is an organ that is there specifically for the baby. It is there only for the baby. It is there to siphon off toxins from the mother's body so that they don't negatively affect the baby. Indigenous cultures thought of the placenta as a, uh, a guardian angel or uh, a twin, a spiritual twin of the baby. That, so that, that the placenta is an organ? In it's the an organ. I see, like the heart is an organ? Exactly, exactly. And it forms, you know, it forms with the mother's help. I don't want to undermine that the mother is helping to create the placenta, but it is specifically there to protect the baby and to nurture and nourish the baby. That, that organ will break down its own body if it feels that the baby needs extra nourishment. It will begin to break down its own cells to feed the baby. Literally, so the five days exists with the baby. And what shape is it? Well, it depends on the on the on the placenta. I mean, it's 
Is it like a lick? See, I always thought placenta after birth, they're synonymous. It's just a bunk that comes out, you know. But I understand that it has tremendous protective and uh, nourishing um, functions. But I, when you say placenta, I can't picture what it is. Like when you say heart, I picture a heart. But I don't. I'm showing my ignorance, but I don't care because I'm sure other people have it as well. What, is, what does it look like? Well, think about what a heart looks like. Yes. You can think about what a heart looks like, only it's larger. Um, it's got a lot of veins running through it. It looks like the tree of life uh, on the baby's side. It's actually quite gorgeous when you look at a placenta. And at some place in the placenta, there's uh, uh, the umbilical cord is attached to it. So uh, if you look on my blog, type in placenta, and you'll see some beautiful pictures of placentas, you'll see the beautiful blue color of the umbilical cord when it's first, you know, when the baby's first born, and these it, these, these these things are beautiful and brilliant, absolutely gorgeous, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, um, on the baby's side. On the mother's side, it looks like a lump of meat. It really looks disgusting, the mother's side of the placenta. It's an organ that attaches to the mother's body on one side, and on the other side is the umbilical cord that comes out from it that's attached to the baby. Uh, so the placenta is a very powerful organ. I want to say that there are there are families that understand the significance of the relationship between the baby and the placenta, especially in indigenous cultures, but more and more, even in America and the Western world, people are getting it and doing something called a lotus birth, uh, which means when the baby is born, afterwards, a few minutes, an hour, whatever, uh, the placenta will be born, and they leave the baby attached to the umbilical cord that's attached to the placenta for several days until the placenta falls off naturally, um, until the umbilical cord, rather, falls off naturally, at which point they are assured that the baby is ready to complete its connection with its placenta. And we know that you know, the placenta is still very much alive even five days after birth during a lotus birth, the placenta will begin to pulse when the baby is nursing. So the placenta is still responding uh, to the fact that the baby is receiving nourishment and getting its needs met. So there's, and we also know in indigenous cultures that fathers have very strict protocols that they follow in order to protect their baby's placenta and their baby's umbilical cord because they are aware that if the wrong people get their hands on it, that their baby can be negatively influenced by evil spirits throughout its life. Wow. So the placenta, when you retain it for several days, it's still attached to the baby? If you leave the baby attached to its umbilical cord without cutting it, yeah. Okay. it will also be attached to the placenta. These are like one unit. Placenta, umbilical cord, baby. Okay. Okay, these are one thing, basically, until such time as somebody cuts it abruptly or cuts it gently or lets it fall off. So they actually leave it connected for day, up to days. Right? For days, yes. It can be come off in two, three, four, five, six, seven days. It depends. It depends on the baby when the baby's ready to uh, to release the connection. And there are beautiful rituals that people follow to bury the placenta, um, I plant a tree where the placenta is buried and create a safe place on this earth where the baby can go to reconnect with its placenta when it needs extra support. So uh, those are some things we can do. However, in our culture, parents are being encouraged, mothers in particular, are being encouraged to vampire the placenta. So we have what's called the ingestion of the placenta. Uh, mothers eating the placenta, quite literally. Uh, women who are being trained to do what's called placenta encapsulation and cook the placenta and turn it into placenta pills that the mother can ingest after the birth. So I have... part of the whole hospital? Uh, no. No, no, this is part of the alternative crowd. Hospitals are going to give parents a very, very hard time if they want to take the placenta out of the hospital because hospitals can sell the placenta right. and hospitals can feed the satanic... 
Yeah. Hospitals are selling the blood, they're selling the placenta, they're selling infant foreskins. And, you know, there's satanic rituals happening all oh. over the planet that involve the ingestion of infant blood and body parts. So we need to be very attentive to this stuff. Uh, that They're not selling it to good people. No matter what's being done in the United States with the placenta, the, what the hospitals are doing and selling it for is not good. It's not going to be good. <laughs> I can assure you these are the wrong people to let get get their hands on your baby's body parts or blood. These are the people we do not want to get their hands on our infant's body parts or blood. Wow. It's a big, big mistake. And also, if a mother is ingesting it, there's going to be reasons. If she's given birth in a hospital, if she's had any kind of trauma during the birth, postpartum depression is going to be likely... And um, ingesting the placenta will calm the postpartum depression. We can feed off of our baby's life force and, and it will help us. There's no question um, that it helps. If you're hemorrhaging at birth and the placenta has come out, if you suck on the placenta, a small piece of the placenta, it'll help stop the hemorrhage. So it has medicinal value. There's no doubt that it does, but we need to be aware that it is our baby's life force, and we need to honor that. I'm sure our baby would be willing to help us. So where did this um, uh, protocol of cooking the placenta and eating it, but the vampiring of the placenta by the mother, where, that comes from more Satanism as it's conducted through the um, alternative channels? I would be interested to research that in the same way that I'm re researching ultrasound and finding out where that technology came from and what the real intention is. Um, yes, I think that's what we'll find, who's behind the promotion of the ingestion of the placenta is probably not going to look too good when we get the, the real answers. Wow. I haven't done that research. So who practices it? I mean, where do people hear about this from? It's all over the internet, you know, it's all over the alternative birth world. People who are doing home birth, people who are doing unassisted birth without any medical people in attendance during home birth, they're all into placenta encapsulation and the consumption of the placenta. So what they haven't thought about is that it's their baby's life force, and that's just something we need to acknowledge. Uh, most humans would be repulsed at the thought of eating an organ or any kind of raw meat. You know, even though you got people out there arguing that we are a meat-eating species, we don't have fangs like carnivores, and we would never be running after an animal, digging our mouths into that animal, ripping off its flesh, and eating raw flesh. Okay, that's not who we are or who we were ever intended to be. It is not natural, it is not normal, and neither is eating the placenta. It is an aberration. Uh, that has become something of a phenomenon because so many women are in a weakened condition after birth because of the way that we're giving birth. Wow. So they're eating their baby's life force and they don't think about it. <laughs> hey, you know, it, Satanism is mainstream. It's the same thing that they're taking. They're taking blood from young people and, in, and putting it into the bodies of older people. And it's all over the nightly news that this is the latest craze. So we got to be aware, Satanism is infiltrating the mainstream in a huge way. So that's it with the placenta. we got a lot going on there. There's more that happens at birth, and I just we got about 20 minutes left, so I want to I wanna talk about the rest of the things if you're ready to move on. I am. Okay. So after they've, they've brutalized <laughs> the baby with uh, taking its blood and its placenta, they're going to do a bunch of mean-spirited spirited protocols uh, once the baby has come out, including taking the baby from the mother. Absolutely, there's going to be very few babies that are allowed to stay skin-to-skin -skin with the mother. And I'm going to say skin-to-skin -skin is very important because the baby and the mother need to smell each other. They need to feel each other. They need to look in each other's eyes, right? The baby needs to hear the mother's heartbeat. All of these senses are what activate the neurobiology of love at birth. 
okay? And every single one of them will be interfered with during a hospital birth and even during some home births that are attended by midwives or uneducated mothers. Okay, and let me tell you how it's interfered with. Number one is separating the mother and the baby during the first hour. Major big no-no. Don't do it. The father needs to be right there if it's possible. The first person this baby should be making eye contact with is either its mother or its father. Okay, the baby needs to look in the eyes of a person that loves it and has a connection with it. Eye contact is extremely powerful in terms of activating the brain to produce the neurochemicals of love. And anybody that's ever experienced human love, authentic human love, will have had that experience of making eye contact with the person that is loved and will feel the download of chemicals into their body simply through eye contact. It has nothing to do with sex, zero. Okay? Eye contact is pristine, pure, a means of experiencing pure, huge, big love that you can feel physiologically in an enormous way that you probably will never feel when you're just having sex for the sake of having sex. So eye contact is important. So what do they have to do in order to break the eye contact? Right, they're going to put a bunch of burning poison in the baby's eyes. What's it called? Um, oh, silver, silver. Yes, erythromycin and silver nitrate ointment. They're going to say they're putting it in the baby's eyes to prevent the baby from going blind. So the ointment burns, but really what it's doing is clouding the baby's vision and preventing the activation of that baby's brain. But Janice, why, why are they even thinking the baby's going to go blind? Ask yourself that question, Sophia. And ask yourselves the question, how is it possible that for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, our species has survived without going blind, without the use of these drugs? Well, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I right. thought they did it because they want to disinfect or clean out the eyes or something, give the eyes a good start with some good, strong disinfectant or mild, dis whatever they call it. Because er erythromycin ointment is an antibacterial kind of a mm -hmm. thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I... Yeah, they're going to say that the mother has bacteria in her vagina, which bacteria is absolutely necessary for the baby to experience to develop gut flora for the development of its uh, uh, digestive system, the proper development of its digestive system, which babies that are born by C-section are going to be missing because they don't get to make their way through the birth portal, through the vagina. Um, they're lying. Everything they say is a lie. Everything. I'm serious. No, I understand. There's, there's no reason for any of this. There's no benefit to any of this. None of it. None of this is beneficial. All of it is harmful, and they know it. It doesn't take much, much researching around the Internet to find out what's happening to babies when you cut the umbilical cord. The whole world should know this because it's readily available. All right, it doesn't take much research to find out, okay, that you're preventing eye contact when you put when you put gunk in the baby's eyes and that eye contact is a primary means to activate the brain. It doesn't take much research to find out that there are pheromones coming off of the baby's head. When the baby is born, those pheromones have a unique smell, okay, that activates human love. When a mother or father smell their baby's head, their brain will trigger the energy of love. It's a, not even just energy, it's a neurobiology. Okay, it's a physiological response that downloads chemicals into the body that creates love. It's quite physiological. So what are they going to do? Let's put a hat on the baby. Right. That's okay? And let's say that this is uh, because the baby might get cold. Hey, if you want to regulate the body, the baby's body temperature, put that baby skin to skin with one of its parents. 
that's a key to regulating the body's body, the baby's body temperature. Yeah, don't put an ugly acrylic dyed hat. Dyed hat that's got chemicals in it, flame retardants, God knows what else. Oh. Okay, the other thing that they're going to do is they're going to swaddle the baby in many cases because because they know that skin to skin is a primary means for the for love to activate. So we can't have skin to skin going on. Let's wrap the baby in a blanket. Okay, the blanket's filled with the flame retardants, filled with the chemicals. It's going to interfere with smell. You know, there are species of birds that will reject their young if the scent is off. Right. If someone touches a baby bird and puts it back in the nest, the mother won't even go near it. The mother may reject it because the scent is off and the mother doesn't recognize that baby as its own. This is the point. This is why they're doing it. The mother will reject her baby. The mother will have all kinds of postpartum depression because she can't bond with her baby. She can't smell her baby. She can't make eye contact with her baby. She can't make skin-to-skin -skin contact with her baby. This is all critically important for undermining human love. And then, of course, we're going to vaccinate the baby. We're going to maybe uh, microchip the baby through the vaccination. We're going to, in we know how the hepatitis B vaccine, which is one of the vaccines that they give right at birth, the first hour after the baby is born, all right, is causing multiple sclerosis, all sorts of autoimmune diseases, and liver problems. The very thing that it's supposed to prevent, it's causing jaundice is being caused by the hepatitis B vaccine. And we know that these vaccines contain <laughs> aluminum, mercury, uh, aborted human fetal tissue, caterpillar eggs, guinea pig brains, bovine fetal serum from cows. Uh, the list of DNA from other species and from aborted babies being injected directly into our children is unbelievable. And they are doing it deliberately to scramble the DNA of our children and to prevent the expression, the full expression of human beings. Now, Janice, I've heard you laugh in that way a couple of times in this show. Is it from horror or... It's history? evil, yes. It's just evil. The unbelievable amounts of evil. If I don't laugh, I can get hysterical. If yeah, I don't, that's it's another like, thing I wanted to ask you, because you said earlier that you had watched a two-minute video about that mother who had had a cesarean, she was unresponsive, and you said you had experienced so much pain watching the video. So you're obviously, yes. you know, you're all over this. This is your passion, your intent on informing as many people as possible. But it can't have a, and it it's must be taking its toll on you at the same time, you know, because you really get it. You get it on a level that I guess even I don't get it uh, because you've been plumbing this and you, you, this is your, this is you. Janice Barcella was born to figure all this out and tell us. That's how I feel about it. You. Oh, maybe that's true. And it does take its toll, uh, not the least of which knowing this is uh, extremely hard and being rejected by people for talking about it because people don't want to deal with it. They don't, many, many people are willing to look at it and I get a lot of positive feedback too, but you know, in communities of professional people, professional birth workers, for example, there is so much resistance to understanding the level of evil that we are up against. And I, you know, people laugh when they're nervous, and I, I'm nervous talking about this. It took me at least four or five years after I recognized the depth of what we were dealing with to come public with it, because I knew the reaction that I was going to get from other birth workers. And I am alienated, you know, from a lot of people, and my family included, because I talk about this. And so the giggling is a, is a, it's a nervousness and a pain, you know, is underneath that. I think a lot of people have the same thing when they're exposed to trauma or something that's painful for them. They may giggle, you know, as a way to shake off the nervous anxiety Right, it's a coping mechanism. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So thank you for pointing it out because it is something I need to deal with. There's nothing funny about this. No, I realize that. Yeah, I know you're not laughing because it's funny. I mean, if I, I'm laughing, it's just terrible. You oh, know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. It's so awful. It's it's un unthinkably 
unnatural and ridiculous and unnecessary. And you know, as you've been talking throughout this interview, I keep thinking of my friend who flew off um, a few days ago and he said that he was going to Texas because his grandchild was going to be born on Tuesday. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what the, all this must or part of it, or a lot of it must have sudden just happened to this poor baby because yeah. it was a scheduled birth. You know, after he uh, said goodbye, he was on the phone and he was in a hurry. And I, that's when I thought to myself, oh boy, this has to be a section or something because otherwise, how does anyone know it's going to be born on Tuesday? Well, it's an induction is how they know. They're going to induce it. And, you know, for those parents who haven't given birth yet, if you allow induction to happen, you have a 75% chance of ending up with a C-section. It's not looking too good. And C-sections are going to undermine bonding in a huge way, and they are major surgery. It's going to take a long time for that mother's body to heal. A long time. Well, and it, it's and abdominal surgery, and I've had abdominal surgery, and it takes you... Six to eight weeks. I mean, the first few days when you're back from the hospital, you cannot move. Everything hurts in your stomach. And I can't imagine having to take care of a baby. I mean, I couldn't even go downstairs to get water or soup. That's the same incision. Yeah, and so the bonding, as we know, if that's the case that a mother can't, is in so much pain, of course, those are very different chemicals than the chemicals of love. Yes. And you see, so bonding, the, 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 that parent-child relationship could be negatively influenced throughout life and most likely will be because most parents don't understand the level of trauma that they've been exposed to and that their baby has been exposed to. And even if they do get it, they're afraid to deal with it, you know. So it's a shame. C-section is major trauma. Okay, right. it's not it's not an easy way out, you know. One thing we haven't had a chance to talk about, and I want to, uh, is is uh, circumcision. If well, you don't mind going well, yeah, there, yeah, we have some yeah. time. Go ahead. So uh, let me say that circumcision ninety six percent of the time in the United States in hospitals is happening without anesthesia. So they, what they do with little baby boys is they have a, a special board called a circumstraint. And in the board is, there's a cutout in the board so that you can place the baby into this board and it fits his little body. And there's straps where you strap down the baby's arms and you strap down the baby's legs so that the baby can't move, certainly can't escape what's about to happen to it. Then what the medical people will do is the, sometimes they'll put a sheet over their, the baby's body. Sometimes they'll put a, a pacifier with sugar in the baby's mouth. So the baby can't scream if there's something shoved into its mouth. It will choke uh, on its own screams. And the sheet over the body will have a little hole where the penis is. And one of the nurses or somebody will come in and get the baby erect to make the penis more easy to work with. Are you kidding? They actually do that? Yes, they do. Oh. And then the, the psychopath with the clamp will come and clamp the baby's penis. Okay? Will crush the glands of the baby's penis will tear the foreskin apart from the glands, literally rip off the foreskin from the infant's glands, and then will slice off the foreskin from Wait, the How infant. do they rip and then slice? Why don't they just slice? Why is the ripping necessary? Because you first have to rip it off in order to get the scissor to get in to, there. To cut it, cut around it. Oh, wow. Okay, so there's a crushing, a tearing, and a slicing, which procedure can take many minutes, five, seven, ten. It depends on the, the skill of the psychopath that they call a surgeon who's what doing. what types of surgeons, are these the obstetricians? Because yes. I, I know that a lot of OBs... Uh, a lot of midwives are doing it, too. The who? Midwives are doing it, too. 
There's midwives. Ina Mae Gaskin, okay, who everybody thinks is the hottest midwife on the planet, was heavily involved in circumcision in her early years. Okay, midwives were taught how to cut off the most sensitive part of an infant boy's penis. This is happening only in the United States, basically, and Israel. Okay, Jewish tradition. The, the God of the Bible demands that people cut off the most sensitive part of their infant son's penis to create a covenant with him because the God of the Bible himself is a psychopath and a demon that's very into torturing children, super into human sacrifice, give me your firstborn, right, sacrifice those animals to me, here, let me sacrifice my own son in the most satanic way, uh, religion is mind control, we've got a bunch of Christians running around with symbols of human sacrifice hanging around their necks and over their beds and going to mass every week and symbolically drinking and eating the blood and body parts of a sacrifice man and they're practicing Satanism. And so are the Jews by doing these very vile and evil things. The Jews have been into human sacrifice for centuries because of their God, who demands it. So when you were talking about God, you know, God created this beautiful birth process and everything created by God, you were specifically... I'm not talking about the judeo I am not right. talking about the Judeo-Christian God, who, by the way, you know, <clears throat> if you read the first uh, book of the Bible... The Judeo-Christian God demands that childbirth be painful, that women should suffer in childbirth. So that's not, the real God, okay, is, is definitely into the creation of life. No matter where you turn in the natural world, no matter how much poison we put down, how much pavement we lay over the natural world, still life comes in between the cracks Okay, you'll see flowers pop up. That's God. God is extremely generous. Life is prolific and, and everything is here for us right from the start to give to us in a very generous and abundant way. That's God. God gives. All right, God is not about um, making any animal, no animal suffers giving birth unless they are in captivity. You can watch your cat give birth. And you will not see your cat suffer unless your cat has given birth in a uh, was born in a traumatic way for some reason. Hmm. Okay, uh, no animal suffers in the wild when they give birth. No human suffers in the wild when they give birth. We gave birth for many generations, despite the history that we've been force-fed and lied to about how women and babies died in childbirth. As I said, women and babies are dying in droves right now in the United States, more so than they probably have at any time in human history. That is the truth, not the lies that we've been fed. We've been fine. We've been giving birth fine. No indigenous culture. You don't watch indigenous women suffer when they give birth. It doesn't work that way. That's not the way God intended. It's intended to be pleasurable. It's intended to be the fulfillment of human love. Yeah, I, I think that is a thought that is so foreign to most modern women and girls that childbirth could be pleasurable because they're it's so indoctrinated in us from the beginning that it's going to hurt like a bitch and... You're gonna, your husband is going to be standing by helplessly watching you hurt, you know, and it, it's the thing that it's the end of the road and, and once it's over, it's over, but not that it's something to remember or anything like that. Yeah, I encourage people, I have a very simple, two very simple articles on my blog at birthofanewearth.blogspot.com, or you could go to birthofanewearth.com. You can find pictorial displays of home birth and hospital birth, okay? And look at the difference. Look at the, the love on the faces of women, mothers and fathers and babies who are born at home compared to what's going on in hospitals. Look at the trauma. Look at the pain, look at the suffering, look at the crying of the infants, the screaming, the terror that's being experienced in hospitals. And just the pictures alone will tell you the truth. Yeah. And this is, this is what we need, you know, we need to have happen. Circumcision is birth rape. Episiotomy is birth rape. Cesarean section is also a form of rape. 
Okay, repeated vaginal exams uh, of a woman that's in labor, com repeatedly shoving strangers' hands into that vagina is rape. And if you're in a hospital, you can have medical students come in, nurses, midwives, doctors, you name it. Everybody can come in and check your vagina if you let them during birth. It's a free-for-all. Yeah. Okay, this is not normal. It's not normal for a psychopath to have a scissor and to cut open your perineum when you're giving birth or to cut any part of your body or your baby's body. This is psychopathy. And it's this amazing is amazing how people will let th them do this because they think it has to be done. You know, that's just the whole authority system. That's right. They just are taught that doctors know best and you're in the hospital steps have to be taken that have to be taken and it's all for your good and the baby's good and we don't understand that it's not that at all it's the opposite it's the opposite and if, if you go into a hospital you're in danger because once you're in their territory it's not easy to protect yourself and the poor fathers you know are are obliged to uh, stand there and watch their partners and their babies be abused no other environment you know would a father stand and stand by and let that happen yeah but fathers are very often going into shock because they themselves have been they have a pattern of parasympathetic shock also from circumcision you know a baby that's being circumcised will scream and scream and then at some point the baby will stop crying which means the baby has gone into shock which means that all of the baby's resources are needing to go to keep the baby alive so the you know the pulse will slow down the heart rate will slow down the blood pressure will slow down the eyes will glaze over the baby's in shock and that's parasympathetic shock it's like playing dead you know an animal will play dead in order to preserve its life in the wild that's what an infant has to do during circumcision and very often that's what a father does when a father is watching a baby his own baby or his partner be abused as he goes into parasympathetic shock and he can't even speak much yeah. less stand up to protect his wife and I gotta tell you dads if you're not able to protect your wife to stand up and protect your partner and your baby at birth that's gonna be the beginning of the end for that marriage because the mother's gonna lose respect and trust for her partner well the best thing is never to enter that system exactly because once it, you're there you know you kind of have to defer to them or they'll put you in uh, manacles and yeah take you somewhere and now or take your baby or take your baby if you go there and you say I don't want my baby vaccinated they can threaten you to take your baby so you don't want to go there you don't no. want to go there you don't want to register your marriage with the state you don't want to register your pregnancy with the state you don't want to register your babies with the state you no. want to avoid this system because it's a very dark system and it'll grab you at any chance it gets and your kids ask you I had this idea that circumcision you had to bring the baby back a few days later but I think it's also performed that same day right sometimes yes wow. normally it's done you know before the baby and the mother leave the hospital sometimes it's pre you know it's postponed some people wait till the eighth day because that's what their sick God says to do in yeah. the Jewish tradition, let me say one more thing. In the Jewish tradition, when this is done in a house and a bunch of family members are standing around watching, some of them are chanting their satanic chants, um, and there's rabbis that actually will not only mutilate the baby's penis, but then proceed to suck the blood off of the mutilated penis. These are satanic rituals called Jewish rituals. Yeah. And you better believe the imprint on the infant is very deep and very dark. Yeah, they've been transferring herpes that way, so it's getting yes. a little bit of flack, that particular... Babies are, babies are dying from herpes. They're getting brain damage from herpes that they got from the rabbi. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, one woman told me that she was a very, very young mother and gave birth and didn't know what she was doing, and she would have opted not to have the baby circumcised but she didn't think that it was going to happen so fast and they just grabbed her baby from her right after it was born and they said they handed it back they said okay he's circumcised now and she said what and it was too late yep so they what, do what? this very fast 
Yeah, and once you do it, you can't undo it. You know, it's not something. It's not something your baby will ever forget. That's well, number one. There's much one. more to it than that, and I have um, done a radio show uh, on this with John Friend. If anyone wants to Google um, or go to his website. Um, Let me quickly state too that you know adult men that have been circumcised as infants are having severe sexual problems, uh, erectile dysfunction, uh, premature ejaculation. They're having there's personality problems. They, there's something called uh, a wrist. I can't even say it. It's a personality problem where they have trouble empathizing because of what's happened to them in infancy. They have trouble making a connection with their partners during sex because they're checking out uh, during sex because of the trauma that's happened to them. This is a, you know, where the wires between sex and violence get crossed and they've been betrayed. They've been abandoned. They've been severely abused. This is ritual sexual torture that's being inflicted on infants. Ritual serial abuse uh, that we are doing to our to our children, or letting them do to our children, and they will not trust their parents. I'm sorry if you let this happen to your baby, and you're not addressing it. It's a real issue. If you're willing to address it and say you're sorry and recognize, you know, the damage you've done by letting this happen, healing can happen. But without it, without parental re recognition, that, that bond is, is going to be messed with. Janice, they're circumcising all the adult men in Africa now because Bill and Melinda Gates are passing the information around that it prevents transmission of HIV. So the adult males are getting ready for this and having uh, it done. The truth is, you know, the U.S. Navy and other, other resources have found that circumcised men have higher rates of HIV, um, and also their partners do. Right. And that's because the exposed glands, the glands is exposed, okay? It's meant to be, it's like a tongue, all right, like if what? you, the glands of the penis. It's like a tongue? It's like a tongue. It's meant to be oh. an internal organ. Right. So it's meant to be covered by the foreskin in the same way the mouth is covering the tongue. If you cut off your mouth and had your tongue exposed all the time, right, you would be exposed to bacteria and things that, that you would not be otherwise if your mouth was surrounding your tongue. Also, your tongue would have to become rough and calloused in order to, because it's exposed to the elements all the time. Right. Okay, the same thing is happening to the penis. It's becoming, the glands of the penis is becoming rough and calloused in order to deal with rubbing against dungarees and, you know, just being exposed to all of the elements. And it's also going to be more vulnerable to being exposed to bacteria. Because there's no protective organ around it. Right. And it becomes desensitized. So it's actually harder to have sex. Much harder. And the guy has to pound in order to, you know, have enough sensation to reach orgasm, which hurts the woman. Uh, this is, you know, and also that the, because the rim of the penis is exposed uh, and it's not supposed to be. When a when an intact man pulls out of the vagina during intercourse, the 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 foreskin will surround the rim of the penis and keep the fluids intact. Okay, but when a circumcised man pulls out, he's pulling out all the fluids, and it's causing an unnatural drying of the vagina. And so there, everybody's out there using all these lubricants in the United States and and Israel, right? The lubricants are highly toxic and poisonous. And they're only necessary because the men have been circumcised. Yeah. Now, there's a huge um, uh, series of drawbacks that are all related to one another and ultimately destroy male-female bonding and, uh, you know, experiences with one another and create new commercial markets and whatnot. But we are kind of uh, at the two-hour mark now, Janice. And said so you could go on for more hours than a mere two, but maybe well, I, I can I, just have you back. Sure. I mean, I really thank you for taking this time. I think we covered a lot of ground, Sophia. So uh, anybody that listens will get uh, 
Well, lots of important information. So thank you for making such a big difference. Well, I hope that a big difference, uh, at least some difference, will be made by this show in addition to all the other great shows you've done. But I had specific questions that I wanted to uh, ask you, which is why I wanted to interview you. So I hope that people have been enlightened. Janice is a powerhouse. She's an amazing person in her depth of knowledge and her desire and, and courage to know all this and then to start putting it out as she does. So her uh, blog is, say that again please, Janice. My website is birthofanewearth.com, birthofanewearth.com. My, my blog is birthofanewearth.blogspot.com. My YouTube channel is Birth of a New Earth also. So I've got lots of information available for free. I encourage you to check out my, my pages. Yeah, and I will write a description of this show on my podcast page, and those links will be there. And please follow Janice. It seems like she's constantly finding out something new. She's got this book coming out that she's going to write about the ultrasound. Um, maybe we should title it Ultra Unsound. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Because <laughs> it is I'm, ultra unsound. I may give that serious consideration. No, it's yours if you want it. I'm right on. Thank you. All right, Janice. Well, I will um, definitely talk to you again, maybe on these podcast uh, platforms, but definitely in person. And I appreciate so much everything that you know and what you're telling us. Thank you, Sophia, and bye for now to all your listeners. Thanks. Bye, Janice. Bye-bye.